We greet all of you tonight and express our thanksgiving for you being here, those who have joined us in live stream also. We consider this a, a fellowship in the truth. Amen. This will be our 21st lesson in the book of Amos. We're in the fourth chapter. We'll be looking at verses 4 through 6. And we are being exposed here to how God carries out judgment. If you want to uh, take particular note of it, how detailed it is. <clears throat> detailed in cause and effect, both. Through Amos, God will announce the advantages that Israel had been given and the miserable way they responded to them. Now this, uh, this is not at all a common perception of God. I actually think there's very few people that see that God holds people accountable for responding properly to what he's given and what he's supplied. I don't think many people see that many Christian people I'm talking about. I don't think they see that. I don't, I don't think this is preached. It, preaching is conducive to this kind of conclusion. There's just too, a spirit of casualness has right. gripped the Western church that is quite alarming to me. For the, uh, those that have eyes of understanding, this is revealing the remarkable extent God has gone to to spare Israel and how utterly stubborn they were. It almost caused, it caused heavenly personalities to marvel. It was so, so bad. And they, had, they, had, they half had never been told in comparison to what's been given in Christ Jesus. Some people think that God is too hard on Israel as spoken here. They would object to it. But for those who uh, understand, God is being glorified in all of this. God's not only commenting on what man is, he's commenting on what he is. There's a statement made in Psalm 139, 4 through 6 that encapsulates this idea. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me is high. I cannot attain to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do have to spend some time thinking about it, how God's, God doesn't miss anything about you. Amen. What's in your mind, what's in your mouth, what's in your hand. And it is, it's, it's too wonderful. That is to say, it's, it goes beyond what we're able to comprehend because for the most part, we, we, don't, we aren't even that acquainted with ourselves. God knows more about us than we know. Yes. Amen. Keeps closer tabs on us. There is a possibility to recover out of the snare of the devil because there's such a thing as godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And just that is uh, conducive to a lot of thought that somebody could recover from the snare of the devil who's infinitely more powerful than any man, man or woman. Amen. That itself is remarkable. You say, well, it's God that recovered. I understand that, but that's not how he says it. That's right. It says, they recovered themselves. This is 2 Timothy 2, 26. They recovered themselves from the snare of the devil. And you, wanna, you don't want to add any buts on a statement like that, and yeah, but the God, don't be adding that, just say it the way it's said. Amen. 
there's a tremendous uh, tendency in people, when their knowledge is expanded, they, they tend to add yeah, but to almost anything, <laughs> almost anything God says. And uh, modify it somewhat. Yeah, but let's not forget it says over here, see, but this isn't the way God teaches. This is the way man teaches. This is an academic approach to Scripture. You do have to be able to integrate all truth. I understand that. But when a statement's made, let that statement stand like it is. And it, there's power in it. That's what it, that's what the table David would say it's too wonderful for me. See, that's why it just, <laughs> it went beyond him. But he knew it was real. All, in Scripture, see, God, God, and even in Amos, he's going to offer hope. Even in Amos, he's going to say, I will, ra I will close up the breaches and I will raise up the ruins. He's going to say that in Amos. See, he's going to leave, leave some hope. But I will tell you that over 50 times in Amos, the words, I will, mm -hmm. over 50 times in Amos, and most of the time is, is, is judgment, yeah. announcing certainty of judgment. Now, I'm persuaded that this is done so no man will assume a favorable judgment from God for those who ignored his warnings. I see some people's theology teaches them to think like this. They think, yeah, we've, we admit we've been wrong with his mercy with the Lord, and you don't want to think like that. There is mercy with the Lord, but it has to be met, preceded by repentance and this sort of, this sort of thing. It's still true that if a person, this is, Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I know people, theologians have had trouble with this. That's another way of saying they didn't believe it. <laughs> That's just what it means. Amen. Yes. I consider that men like to add this, those two words into what God has said to make themselves comfortable in their sin. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Amen. There remains no more sacrifice for sins if they sin willfully. If they sin because they want to. After they've received a the knowledge of the truth. Well, what should those people expect? He tells you. But a certain, a what? A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That's in the New Covenant Scriptures. There it is. See, words like Bemus is saying and words like that are designed to take this seriously, awake to righteousness and sin not. That was the rest of the church, 1 Corinthians 10, 34. So sin is always a serious matter. And I don't think anyone here has adopted a theology that does it, but it, I may be wrong. <laughs> but you do not, do not want to embrace a theology that modifies these things. Amen. All right, we're going to be in verses 4 through 6. Come to Bethel and transgress. <clears throat> this is God talking now. At Gilgal, multiply transgression and bring your sacrifice every morning and your tithes after three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord. I also and I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, Amen. saith the Lord. Hmm. 
strong, strong language. This is a, an arresting exposure to God. Now, if this doesn't fit in with it, like a, the concept or the idea you have about God, then you just have got the wrong idea. That's what that means. And you got to find out why you do. Why do you think the way you do about God? If, you're, if it conflicts with this. 100% of the time, it's because of what somebody else said. It's not because you misunderstood the Bible. Uh-uh. <laughs> the Word of God doesn't do that. Unless you got a hard heart and then God blinded you to it. He's going to, what God's going to do, he's going to tell the people, be more aggressive in your idolatry. Throw yourself into your false religion. At least don't play around with it. That's what he's going to tell them to do. <laughs> this is God. Oh, I'll tell you. Come to Bethel and transgress. Does that sound like something God would say? Well, under certain conditions, yeah. Other versions say, enter Bethel and transgress or sin or commit a crime or do wickedly or rebel. Go ahead and sacrifice to the idols in Bethel. The Living Bible says, sin all you want. The temporary English version says, and come to Bethel where the golden calf is and transgress. <laughs> That's good news for some people. Bethel was a place where a golden calf was. There's a golden calf at Bethel. Been set up in order to make their religion convenient. Because to go to Jerusalem, that was, that was too, too demanding. As it said in 1 Kings 12, 28, 29. It's too, too far to go to Jerusalem. Let's, say, let's, be more, let's have it more convenient. Let's, uh, let's split up in small groups. See, that's what they'd say today. Let's make it more convenient. Let's have as few people present as possible. That's what they're saying, but they don't understand what they're saying. Let's, let's have as little real knowledge as we can have. Come to Bethel. There was an altar there to its place there. Second Kings 23, 15 says... That golden calf was in it. A special altar was there. God says, come on. Come to Bethel and transgress. And at Gilgal, multiply transgression. Now, this is holy sarcasm, but there's uh, yeah. something to be seen here. Gilgal was a place where sacrilege was committed in the name of the Lord. This is said of one place of Gilgal. Hosea 9.15. This is a startling word now. You've got to be ready to receive this. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. Whew. All their princes are revolters. It's God said that. Amen. Now he says, go on. You know what I said at Gilgal. You know what I said at Gilgal. And you're still dawdling around. Go, go on to Gilgal and multiply your transgressions. Hosea also often mentions sacrifices that were made there in, in Gilgal. It wasn't always a bad place like that. During the time of Samuel, it was a holy place where proper worship took place. This is a place where Samuel pioneered their return to God and the reestablishment of the kingdom here at, at Gilgal. Now, however, this very place had become a location for sin that was committed under the cloak of religion. <laughs> Religious sins he's talking about. You've got to really see the charges leveled at Israel. Their religion had become sinful. That's the point he's making. When they came to Bethel to worship, 
It was really nothing more than transgression. A breaking of the covenant and the indulgence in idolatry. When they sent to Gilgal, when they went to Gilgal to worship, they only multiplied their transgressions. None of them were forgiven. They all heaped up and got worse. Their religion was making them worse and increasing the wrath of God against them. See, that's kind of a challenging thought, isn't it? do with the, the thought that's going around that says there isn't any, anything that you could do to make God love you any less. <laughs> yeah. And here he says I won't love I you won't anymore. I won't love him anymore. Every false doctrine can be dismantled. If you can't do it, somebody can. Every false doctrine can be dismantled and taken apart. And I can imagination can be cast down. This is what some of the Paul did in some of his epistles. He dismantle an erroneous idea. He just dismantle it and tear it apart. Now there's hardly anybody doing this today. Either on a it, from a small church to a mega church, there's very few people that are doing this. They're taking false, erroneous ideas that are damning people and taking them apart and disassembling them so people can see Amen. how false they are. They're made up of rotten boards that aren't even put together well. Yeah, that's right. This is what Paul would say, stop the mouths of the gainsayers. See, that's, what he's, that's what he's talking about. Show how wrong they are. So he's, he's challenging the Israelites. The prophets had already talked to, talked to them about these things. That's right. And until this is done, like you said, dismantling these imaginations, they'll actually alter a way, a, the way a person that's, reads the scriptures. That's right. They'll read them into them, even though it's not there. Yeah. They, they, what they'll, when they read the scriptures, it'll be like, see, they'll try to prove they're right. Their false doctrine's right. By the same scripture, you can prove it's false. I know it. It's like, what is that? It's because in their mind, there's this illusion going yeah. on. Yeah. And, and they, you know, the, that scripture that you read, that for if they fall away. Yeah. A, a man told me, he used that scripture to try to prove that a person couldn't fall away. It's like... <laughs> it means God warned you about something that was impossible. Yeah. See, but all sin also is an insult to God. Yes. False teaching insults God and demeans Christ. So their religion, Israel's religion, was making them worse and worse. <laughs> you suppose I mean, something like that could still happen? The person's religion making them worse. If you could just get them away from their religion, they might think maybe they could recover. But it's hardly possible for them to recover under that situation they're in. He tells them, oh, come to Bethel, transgress, go to Gilgal, multiply your trans transgressions, bring your sacrifices every morning. Be regular and consistent in what you do. Come on now, bring your sacrifice. They bring them to idols. Every morning, the law said every morning. There was a morning sacrifice. Every morning. Now, you don't want to do less under Christ than they did under the law. They had a sacrifice in the morning, a sacrifice in the evening, all the time. I give you the text there. However, in bringing... In bringing their offering every morning, as the law prescribed, they were really sinning because they offered it to the wrong God. Yes, that's right. See, a lot of what's going on today is offered to the wrong God. Yeah. It's not even offered to the right God. Right. Yeah. They call it praise and worship, but it's sin and transgression. Uh -huh. Amen. It's offered to a strange God. Bring it every morning. You'll be actually sinning. He said, bring your, uh, bring your tithes after three years. 
Actually, a tithe of the seed was that was produced by the field was to be brought every year. Deuteronomy 14.22. On the third year after the sabbatical year, they were to bring a tithe in. On the third year after the sabbatical year. Here's the uh, text in Deuteronomy 26. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and has given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fathers, and widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Right? That's the text that they'd be, be using. But the scripture goes on to specify why they did that. The land had lay idle for seven years. There shall be a sign unto thee, ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself. So whatever... They remember, they didn't till the ground. So whatever just grew up by itself, you could eat that first year. And the second year, that would spring up of the same. So the second year, you did the same thing. You ate what came up. And in the third year, sow ye and reap and plant vineyards. So the third year, you put, then you paid the big tithe out of, what, out of that. that. That was the thir third year tithe. It was, but what did Israel do? They took that special law and they only gave their tithes once every three years. They took that text and used it to substantiate bringing their tithes in every three years. <laughs> well, of course, people don't do things like that anymore, take texts like scripture like that and rest it, but they, uh, they did that. They could point to the Bible. They could say the third year is the year of tithing. They didn't bother to tell the people, well, that's a special rule for the years after the Sabbath year. You're going to say something, Brother G? I was just thinking about cutting your tithe by two-thirds. Yeah. That's <laughs> what this text actually says is, a, right. is, is a half again for a double tithe. Yeah. Yeah. Third year, isn't uh -huh. it? Yeah. And then a double tithe? Yeah. Sto astonishing. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can see what they did. Coming from a kind of a legalistic background myself, I could almost see what they did. Well, it says right over here in Deuteronomy 26 and 12, every third year, the third year is the year, is the year for tithing. There it is. But it was, a, it was a special stipulation because the law else was said every year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw Carol on there. The year they stopped paying the tithes and they only paid every two years, their debt began to build up. Yes, that's right. Amen. And we can look at it as it may have not seemed such a big thing to miss a couple mm. tithes here yeah. and there, but it is, and it became, it, um, started to grow, and the debt became even greater. That's right. Yes. It's all, this is the way it is. Um, sin doesn't just, it doesn't just start out massive, and that's how it happens. Mm. It starts small and it continues yeah. to grow, sometimes yeah. fast and sometimes slowly, but it does grow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And eventually, yeah. it appears here, eventually over time, this is just taken for granted that this is, this is what you do. It reminded me of like what I was taught for years about baptism. They would use Romans 6. <laughs> to teach the method of baptism. That's not what Paul's talking about there amen. at all. You're right, amen. No emphasis is made about dying with Christ. Yeah, yeah. It's just a proof text mm -hmm. for methodology, which the apostle's not even talking about amen. at all. Amen. I mean, it's there, but that's not his point. It's not his theme. No. And then but over the years, it just becomes yes. Yes. standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that if some, some of those folks... If you talk to them about dying with Christ from Romans six, they would say, "Oh, we got to be, we got to be immersed. We've got to be baptized. That's what they're talking about." They wouldn't have a clue. What I know you're it. Talking about. I know it. And I, I think probably every sect has something like, yeah, yeah, have something I'm like sure. that that uh, makes them. That's what makes them a sect. Magnifies the that's right. Yeah. To to the biggest and most important thing, and then they built a fence and a building around that thing to that's protect right. it because they've got the corner on the truth. That's right. <laughs> so the Lord tells them, keep on bringing them ties in every every three years. 
Yes, there are people who think they're worshiping, but they're really transgressing. There's such a thing. Well, we have it right here in the text. Jesus referred to these kind of practices when he walked among men. Mark 7, 8. How be it in vain they do worship me. Think, think of that, what, that, what he said. He wasn't talking to Roman citizens. He was talking to Jews that went to the temple and went to the synagogues and read the law and lived by the law. And he said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. So in their, their, their religion became a sin. lesson about the, this divine sarcasm, the objective behind it. That reminds me of turning someone over to Satan, mm -hmm. that they may be taught not to sin. That's Isn't good. it the same thing? That's, yes. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Deliver them to Satan. Yeah. 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 Anyway, it's quite a quite a word. You're see, seeing something about God there. That obviously this is an expression that has been preceded by a phenomenal amount of long suffering. You got to see that too. There been a there been an extraordinary amount of long suffering before he speaks like this, and it stretched over a period of uh, about seven hundred years. So it had been a lot of a uh, lot of long suffering. Doesn't speak like this, you've got the wrong God. Wrong God. Mm -hmm. He continues, verse 5 Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Go ahead and do that. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. With a thank off, with a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving, a thank offering. Offer it with leaven. With, with leaven which the law forbade a sacrifice like that. The law stipulated any sacrifice to be offered, it could not be offered with leaven. That's spelled right in Leviticus 2.11. You cannot offer a sacrifice with leaven. It has cakes offered, it had to be unleavened. The offering of thanksgiving was to be offered, Leviticus 7, 12, with unleavened cakes. It's clearly stated, you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering to the Lord made by fire. <laughs> there, there is a brand of Christianity afoot in the land today that could not keep that commandment. Religion is not taken seriously enough to obey that details. Mm -hmm. Don't ever burn any leaven or any honey. Don't do that. See, it's, it's, too, it's too detailed for the, <laughs> for the modern Christian. They say, well, what difference does that make? Yeah. Made a lot of difference. Israel had made its own rules. Somebody at some time said it's okay to offer the offering of Thanksgiving with leaven. It's, it, we're kind of used to making our bread with leaven. We make our bread with us in mind instead of with the Lord in mind. Because when you make me bread, unleavened. You want leaven? Well, for me, unleavened. See, But somewhere somebody decided it was all right. Now, what he's saying to them, go ahead. See if you can avert my judgment by offering those leaven cakes. Oh, come on now. Offer thanks, offer a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and see if that will alter me, my attitude towards you. Uh, do it every day. Do it a lot. Multiple times a day. See if I'll receive it. Yes, see, that's what he's, that's what he's saying. 
Then he says, um, publish and proclaim the free offerings. That make, make known what you did. Put, broadcast what you're doing. Well, let, let it be made known. Brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them. That's what the NIV says. Let the news of your free offerings be given out publicly. Basic Bible English. Make a public display of your voluntary offerings in that Bible. New Living says, you can brag about it everywhere. Just, boy, just tell it, love, boy, that fellowship today. We offered up all these offerings, thank offerings, with 11 cakes. Oh, boy, it was. It says, just proclaim it and publish it. Do you think, it, what are your thoughts on this? In the Christian world, is there more talk about what men do or about what God does or did or what God did? or what Christ has done. What's talked about more? Everybody everybody pretty well knows the, knows the answer. See if God can be satisfied by what you do. Just do it. Then the phrase, for this liketh you. We'd say this is just like you. Some versions say this, you love to do this. You love to talk about yourself, boy. I notice that when you people get together, they that feared the Lord spake often about him, but the others, they talk, get together and talk about themselves and all the things they've done. You love to do this, the New American Standard Bible says. This pleases you, the American Standard Bible says. This is what you people of Israel love to do. God's Word Bible. How you pride yourselves and crow about it everywhere. Living, <laughs> there's so much of this that happens. It's all, it's all, it's, it's, it's almost humorous how much of this goes on. You turn on the religious TV and here's somebody bragging about what they've done. You go to one of the conventions and they they brag about what somebody's done. They honor the, for what they've done. Become fashionable, see. It justifies their attitude. That's right. You know, God wants to fulfill all your dreams. That's right. You're important to God. Yes. Israel was prone to publish and proclaim what they had done, drawing attention to their own ideas, but when, they, when God got down to working on the day of Pentecost, they talked about the wonderful works of God. Mm. Yes, Amen. <laughs> And what the Lord had done. Yes. Amen. That's what they talked about. Yes. When Jesus walked among men, now the same condition prevailed. Mm -hmm. The people were following the traditions of men mm. rather than the commandments of God. They transgressed. Mm. The scribes and Pharisees, they said to Jesus, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Mm. Yes, yeah, Jesus said. Why? Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Why, why don't you preach what's in the quarterly? How come the official doctrine of the fathers of our movement, why, why aren't you preaching what they preach? Mm. This kind of reasoning still, oh, yes. <laughs> still goes on. Are you a part of our movement or not? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Jesus answered, he said, well, you've made the commandment of God of none effect. Yeah. Your tradition yeah. has depowered yes, the commandment yeah. of God mm -hmm. for, for their experience. See? Yeah. If you believe the commandment, it hasn't, de it hasn't made it of none effect to you, mm -hmm. but it had to them. The tradition of men. Jesus said, by doing it, you're rejecting God's commandment. In other words, to take hold of the commandments of men, you've got to let go Amen. of the commandments of God. Yeah, that's right. You can't, you can't have them both. Uh -huh. When Jesus walked among men, this, uh, this condition still existed. This is the kind of thing that was taking place in Amos, was called a prophesy against Israel. There was a sense... 
in which it was even worse because they were worshiping an idol. They weren't even pretending to worship the true God. They were mm -hmm. worshiping an idol. Because they were told, this is the statement when they, when they reared that idol, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. This is just, um, this is too much to ask. Yeah. Behold thy gods, you would set up this idol. Behold thy gods which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. It's almost identical to what, they, what, what Aaron said. Yeah, he, built yeah, a golden yeah. he said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. You know, man. No wonder Moses came out and said, Aaron, what, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. said, well, mm. brother, I threw the gold yeah. in the fire yeah. and this calf yeah. jumped out. <laughs> yeah. I imagine, mm. I can't imagine what Moses' response, yes, son. Yeah, whenever someone says something that's contrary to the Word of God, they always have a different agenda. That's they right. have a motive. Yeah. Jeroboam was trying to keep the ten tribes That's to himself. That's he was right. afraid that they would revert to going back to Jerusalem and therefore would them, become yeah. subject again, that the kingdom would be put back together. Yes. And he'd lose what he had. And so he wasn't a care for the people. Mm -hmm. he, no. he told them what what would be comfortable for them to hear. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. But it, the, the motive was his own uh, advantage, not theirs. Amen. If he had cared for the people, he would have brought them to the Lord. Well Amen. said. When you, when you create a doctrine that, that implies that people can participate in salvation, independent from walking, following after Christ, taking up their cross, You've done this very thing. That's right. That's right. Now this is a, this is 700 years after this calf was set up. Seven, seven centuries. How, how long has America been a nation? That, that tells you something, huh? And you can see what's happened in 245 years. 237 years, you can see what happened. Think what it could happen with, with under the leadership of flesh after 700 years. Three times longer. Now, but during that 700 years, they had righteous judges, they had righteous kings, they had holy prophets. That were sent early. Remember, they sent, God sent the prophets early to warn them ahead of time and ensure that they knew what they were doing. But in spite of that, here's this condition before them. Now, the same kind of spirit exists in our day to day, the same kind of spirit. See, this tells us something about Satan. Satan this is Satan's strategy. Satan was behind all this. This is his strategy, to get the people to invent their own kind of religion. That's his, to placate them, make them feel, feel comfortable. But the scripture tells us that there is such a thing as pure religion. Now people say, we don't have a religion. Yeah, see, I, I don't know who let these people loose, but I wish they'd go back under the rocks where they were. Religion is a good word. Amen. Paul said I follow, he followed the religion of the Jews. And James said, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Let's do something about it. Yes. And keep yourself unspotted from the world. Amen. Now, there's all kind of religion today that doesn't do either one of those. I mean, we got rest homes, we got orphanages, we got all kind of things that eliminate the need for the first and unspotted from the world. How are you going to win the world if you don't spend some time with them? You know, you don't tell you're in the world. 
That's being with them, isn't it? Yes. When the mind. And unbelieving you. They have <laughs> nursing homes. They yeah. have orphanages. That's right. Yeah. Amen. When the minds of the people are set on things above, their focus is placed on what the Lord has done. That's what happens when you're when your affection and your mind is set on things above, what happens is you are dominated by thoughts about what the Lord has done, and it's marvelous in your eyes. Now, God uh, challenges Israel to see their self-made, see if their self-made religion will actually work. Yeah. Yeah. Before you move on from that point, I was considering this convenience of religion mm. and the, the contrast of that that's shown in Scripture. Whenever there's a heart that's toward God that knows what the Lord has done yeah. and is moved by what he's yeah. done, mm -hmm. was David when he came to offer the sacrifice at the threshing floor. And the man wanted to make it convenient for him. Hmm. Yes. I'll give you everything you need. The animals, the threshing floor, it's yours. You do as it, with it as you please. Sacrifice to the Lord. He yeah. tried to make it convenient. Mm -hmm. But David said, no, I won't offer the Lord what costs me nothing. Amen. Yeah. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah. It's, Amen. It, whatever you want to comment about the things of God and the illustration, it's all in the scripture. Yes. Yeah. Everything is there to build sound yes. ideas and concepts us what it means by what it says. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, it does. Yes. Amen. Yes, I also have given you cleanness of teeth. I have given you. You would never have imagined that he'd given them anything by the way they were conducting themselves, but he had given them, but he's going to say, he's not talking about gifts of good things. Yeah. He's going to say, I've given you famines. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of thing he's going to say. The shortage of food they were experiencing had come from God. Amen. It was like a wake-up call. Perk up. Now, some people may have explained it by the well. There's been a change in the weather and weather and weather patterns. It hasn't rained for a long time, and that's what caused this. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone report about a famine or something like that in some part of the world and suggest that God sent it. Maybe I don't think I've ever heard anyone actually say that, but that's how the prophets talked. And now God says, well, I, he's going to tell him he sent the famine. That's what cleanness of teeth means. Cleanness of teeth doesn't mean bright, shining teeth. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> in other words, they, they hadn't been eating anything, so there wasn't any food particles in their teeth. That, that's what he's saying. I've given you clean to the teeth. You don't even have evidence of food or that you ever eat on your teeth. That's how sparse the food's been. But yes, amen. Cleanness of teeth. He was speaking of Israel whenever he led them out of Egypt. And it's applicable to this. He says, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thy heart whether thou wouldst keep my commandment or no. And then again, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. When he gave them these things, it was to humble them yeah. and to bring them back to him and That's they right. didn't do it. They wouldn't do it. Amen. Yeah. That's what sin does to begin. What you want to see is this this is what sin does. People that fall into sin can't like jump out. It's not that simple. They have to be delivered. The deliverer has to come. He's done the same thing to our country over and over. I mean, you could probably just track it down. Look at when major sins entered. 
the mainstream of America, and God judged them and, and, and sent the jobs over there and did this, or did all kinds of things to get their attention. Mm -hmm. But they just refused. No. They said, no, this is, so what did they do? We'll, we'll take prayer out of school. We'll do this. We'll do that. Well, what are all these things? They were reactions. They, yes. they, Anyway, I, I can see it. Oh, God, yes. God is, it, it's, this last judgment, or, or, or if there was just one final judgment, but the judgment that's going to hit America is going to come because they didn't listen. Amen. They didn't see all the yeah. warning signs. Amen. All the, I mean, the last 30, 40 years yes. has just been filled with warning after warning. I know. How long is it going to go on? Yeah. Mm. yeah, one of the things that struck me whenever Katrina hit New Orleans... What's the first thing they yeah. built afterwards? Yeah. Their casinos. Yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. Yes. We all know what New Orleans is famous mm. for. Yeah. That's right. It's not talked about openly, yeah. even by the wicked and ungodly. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, some of you may remember hearing this after the 9 11 incident. A couple of very prominent media preachers suggested that it was because of sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was an uproar yeah. that yeah. those guys oh, yeah. had to come on, come on the air and say, "That's not what I meant." Now, <laughs> but that is what they said in the first yes, place. Yes, yeah. amen. amen. I remember that. Yeah. I remember it. No. I've given you yeah. cleanness of teeth. So I, you would be interested in how some versions translate this. The NIV says, "I gave you empty stomachs." I kept food from your teeth. I made your teeth clean of food in all your cities. I gave you absolutely nothing to eat in all your cities. I, I brought hunger to every city. I sent you hunger. I didn't give you any food to eat. Food shortages for you in all your cities. I emptied your pantries and cleaned out your cupboard. But they didn't see. False religion desensitizes people. We read this, we say, how could anybody miss that yeah, yeah. by embracing an erroneous religion? Amen. It Amen. dulls the mind, right. makes the person incapable of thinking. They can't recognize what, what God is doing. That's what that's Satan's strategy. Yeah. He corrupts the mind. That's right. I'll tell you the, what the opposite of clean teeth Remember when Israel murmured and said, bread, this, we, we get into this bread, we're getting tired of this bread all the time. We want flesh. We want meat. We want meat. We want meat. So the Lord sent quail, you remember? To them, several cubits thick around the camp. Remember you're talking about camp, three million people? I mean, how could, who could estimate how many quail there was? But here's what he said, and while the quail was yet between their teeth, there it is. Clean teeth is the opposite of that. <laughs> they weren't given to, to eat anything. And uh, I sent want of bread, lack of bread in all your places. Scripture speaks of times when God called for a famine. Gee, this is God. He called famine. He just called for one that came. And he said to Ezekiel, I will break the staff of bread. Same thing. Talk about a famine. Psalmist used the same expression. I will break the staff of bread. <laughs> Through the law, God warned Israel what would happen if, if they did not hearken to him. He said, Leviticus 26. Now we're way before you, end, long time before they entered, they entered into Canaan. This is said. When I have spoken, when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. What do you mean? The oven wasn't a big oven. We could only muster up, for this whole batch of people, we could only muster up ten loaves of bread, and you just ate enough to make you hungry. I caused that, God said. I, you leave me, I'll, this is what I'll cause. They didn't believe this. Amen. They got to that point, they didn't believe that God meant that when he said it. Yes. But he did. Yes. He broke the staff of bread. 
Isaiah 3, 1, Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord, the, the Lord, the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem and from Judea the stock and the store. The whole, the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water just took it away. I don't like to think about it, but God could turn Walmart belly up. And something like that will happen if, it, if, if good old USA doesn't wake up. Something like that will happen. Stock in the store. Stuff on the shelf and the place where they sold it took it away. The Lord, Lord warned the disobedient Israel, I'll send a famine on the land. I don't doubt that few people would associate a famine or scarcity with the judgment of God, but this is, this is the thing that happens. Amen. Now listen, after God told what he did, after he challenged them, pour yourself out in your religion. Do as much as you can of it, and you will find out that it will not turn away what I'm going to do. Yeah. He said, yet have ye not returned to me. Another place, he said, what more could I have done? You still not come back to me. This phrase, ye have not returned to me, is mentioned five times in the fourth chapter. Five times he says, you have not returned to me. Yeah. Uh, some people can do this more effectively than others. But there are some people that need to be told this. All this has happened and you still haven't returned. Yes, amen. Your life's have fallen apart uh -huh. and you, you still haven't returned. You lost your job, you lost your beginnings, your marriage fell apart, and you still haven't returned. Amen. See? This is how God reasons. Now, in other words, not only should they have returned, they could have returned. Yes. Amen. You wanted them to. That's right. Yeah. They could have returned. So this confirms that sin causes perception and sound reasoning to leave the person. They become a spiritual idiot. This is what happens. And so if you talk to them like they can think right, see, you, this isn't, they can't. That's their trouble. So you've got to use, you've got to have these spears, you know, and yeah. knife attack, so to speak. No, I've done this with children, raising children. I mean, if they won't listen, you say, well, go ahead and do that yeah. then. And let's see what really happens. Yes. You know? And then they get the punishment for doing it so yes. that they can get the point. That's right. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Now, Moses described the condition this way. But Jeshurun, that's a name ascribed to Israel several places. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked and thou art waxing fat thou art grown thick thou art covered with fatness then he forsook the Lord God who made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation see he got insensitive he could, there was so much fat he couldn't get through to, to the sensitive part he couldn't feel anything see <laughs> dull the conscience was dull the thinking was dull and it just it just like a beast. Yeah. Fat beast. What happened when they got that way? They forsook God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Which in this case, our case is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have a very high regard for yeah. Jesus at all. So they they, they thought nothing of forsaking him. What made him that way? Sin made him that way. Sin made him spiritually fat. Not fat like fat and flourishing. Not that kind of fat. Fat and dull. Yeah. Yeah. 
There is, then, praise the Lord, a due time afforded for a person to grow up and be sensitive when for the time you ought to be teachers. See, the God, so the God assigns a period of time when this you can grow up and but when a person sins, they don't grow up, they grow down. See? Instead of becoming sensitive, they become insensitive. That's what had happened to Israel. Now, he wrote this so that succeeding generations could recall these words when they went into an empty Jerusalem. Hmm. They saw the ruins of the temple. They saw the people scattered. The ground turned into a desert. You can remember these words. And in Nehemiah's day, they confessed. We, we sinned. That's why we got in this shape. We sinned. So I don't, I don't know that anyone here is become insensitive, but if you have, it's your sin that made you that way. And if you know anyone has become insensitive, it isn't because you didn't do a good job of witnessing to them. See, Satan will bludgeon you. See, if you had done a better job, you, you'd have just done a better job of witnessing to them, they wouldn't have done that. Well, look at what a job would witness to these people. Amen. Moses did, the prophets did, the David did, but they, uh, they waxed fat. And what happened? They kicked, kicked, kicked. Kick. Yeah. I don't want to hear any more about that. I'm, we probably dealt with some people that kicked, haven't you? Uh -huh. All right. There, anyone else? You have a word you'd like to add, Sister Henny? Um, for what sin is, it's like at first. In, um, I know with our garden, we have these weeds that sprout up because they're, they just sprout up and brush all the nutrition out of our garden. And, um, something I was considering is that while it may be visibly growing above the ground, you can tell that it's growing. It's even more so growing below the ground. Yeah. It may not be oh. seen by just looking at it. Yeah. And then the longer you let go, the longer it grows, it's harder to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And That's then right. once you have... And sometimes when you pull it, you may have thought you've gotten rid of it now, but there's still some of that root inside there that you were able to reach, yeah. and you were able to take out with it. And how when um, when we are seeking out the Lord, we have to make sure we get rid of every bit of the sin and not leave any bit of it behind. Amen. 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 Judah? Yeah. As you were talking about self self-made religion. I thought even that phrase, self-made religion, it's like put it, t taking two batteries and putting both positive ends together. It repels. It repels. Religion. It has, it, it has been garbled and redefined to where people throw it around lightly. But in its true meaning, religion is a sacred word. It can't be thrown around. And which, which is what people today yeah. have done with it. Yeah. So it is offensive to God <laughs> to have people making fake religion. Artificial, yeah. not real, counterfeit religion. And so any religion that doesn't have God behind it won't stand. That's if right. it does stand mm -hmm. for long, it's a very temporary ordeal. Because Old time religion. That's what the Hindus put it as. Old time religion. That's believing the Lord. Believing the one true king and doing what he bids us to do with only the strength that he can give. So, Babylon originated with a man dreaming up a false religion. And it's grown into a monster. But what did God say about it? Babylon will fall in one hour. Not a very long span of time. That's right. I will mm -hmm. overthrow it. There will be none left of it. Not one brick on top of another. It's going to be a complete destruction. So, 
don't dream up a religion that God has to be against because it conflicts His nature. Because when you don't have the Lord on your side, then you're just going to get bulldozed. So we have to stand behind the Lord because when the Lord is standing against you, you won't stand. That's right. Amen. There's something the devil doesn't tell people when he tempts them, that when, when, when you sin, you become obtuse or, or hardened. Yeah. To where you you know, you'll reason it out. You know, people will reason out. Well, it, it won't be so bad. You know, that's yeah. what the devil tells you. It won't be so bad. Uh -huh. But he forgets to tell you that now you have to be delivered because you can't mm -hmm. you can't make yourself repent. Yeah. He didn't tell you all that. So you know, it, it, this false doctrine and, and what Brother G was talking about Babylon. See, they they've got these structures to where it looks like they're alive. It looks like they're doing the right thing. They're doing the sacrifices every morning. But the problem is, is that God's not receiving it, and their heart's just Amen. getting harder and harder. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mike? You can see an intensification in the uh, words of Amos the prophet, mm -hmm. where in the beginning, it's, it sounds like God is reasoning with the people by getting them to think about these other nations and what he did to them. Mm -hmm. But when he when he gets to this point in our the text this evening where he's he's talking with sarcasm, this isn't reasoning. He's not reasoning with them anymore because they're not going to get this. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. Which That's right. means, as in other times, that this means the judgment is coming. Yeah, amen. You know, amen. He's going to speak it in a way that they don't even know what he's talking about, but he he'll he'll justify himself, yes. be righteous. Amen. Saying the judgment, amen. and also remind me of. Uh, when uh, Israel was, when the Babylonian captivity was over and uh, the decree was, was given to return to Jerusalem and build a temple, and uh, after a few years they stopped building the temple. And the Lord, the Lord sent uh, famine and dried up the rain, and they earned wages to put in a bag with holes, and there was no work for anyone to do, and, and many died. Because they stopped the work of the temple, it's a similar situation. Amen. Yeah, I can see why we're we're told to take every every thought captive, captive. and bring it yeah. in Amen. to subjection to Christ. Mm -hmm. Because this is this is how the devil will, will this is his infiltration area is in our in our thinking, yeah. and if we don't keep keep those thoughts into subjection, then these erroneous ideas will start coming in and erode away. Mm. And cause for us to be insensitive to what God has said. Amen. Amen. Um, when people worship different gods, they aren't worshiping anything but a statue, because there is only one God, and that God is the true King. Mm. That's right. Amen. 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 Mm. All right. We'll have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Our dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for the prophet Amos, for the candor with which he spoke. And Father, we uh, we pledge ourselves before men and before angels and before thyself that we will keep the faith and run the pace with ra the race before us with patience, abstaining from every appearance of evil. And we ask, Father, that you provide us with the grace to carry this to its fullest extent. In Jesus' name, amen.